All right. Can everyone hear me in the back, or do we need more volume here? All right. All right, thanks everyone for being here. I am Mike Saunders, uh, Hardwater Hacker, Principal Consultant for Red Siege. Today we're gonna talk about Web App 101, getting the lay of the land. <clears throat> oh hey, turn the clicker on. So, disclaimer, if you came here to find out about technical attacks like how to do SQL injection and cross-site scripting and XXE and stuff like that, I'm sorry, that's not this talk. I'm not going to be talking about that. So this talk about process, about enumeration, things like that. So just know that that's what the talk is about. So why am I giving this talk? How many of you are new into web app pen testing? OK, a lot of hands. How many of you have started testing an app, found something that was ooh shiny, went down the rabbit hole, and didn't make it out the other side? Yeah, and it still happens. Like, I'll tell you, it happens to me. So. When I got into web app pen testing, it started out with getting a copy of WebInspect and go forth and scan websites. And that's what I did. And I wasn't really given any direction on what I'm supposed to do, how web app pen testing works, nothing. And so I would stick a site in WebInspect and it would spit out a report. And eventually I started, you know, thinking that this is ineffective. I'm not doing a good job. Uh, there's got to be more to this. And I started getting into doing some manual testing, using burp, something like that, to do my testing. And that's what would happen. I would start enumerating a site. And I'd find that one request that just looked juicy. And I'm like, that is SQL injection for sure. Or that is IDOR or whatever. I'd see it, and I would get lost. I would spend so much time on that thing that I would forget that I needed to test other things. And then the end of my time period would come, and I'd be like, I have not scanned everything. This is not good. And I didn't know how to not do that, how to not get ooh shiny. And I had a chance to go to uh, SEC 542 from SANS. I took it from Kevin Johnson. And that was a complete turning point for me. And not because of the technical things I learned, because at that point, I had a pretty good understanding of testing the vulnerabilities, testing for them, identifying them, how they worked. Uh, but I learned about process, <clears throat> how to effectively plan out and execute the engagement so you don't get ooh shinied, so that you get through your inventory, you get all the way through your scope, and you can do an effective test. And so that's what I'm trying to do here is distill some of what I learned there in a week-long class into this talk so hopefully you have some tools that you can use when you go back to your job and start doing testing. So... The first thing I want to talk to you about is scoping, and it is the single most important part of the test. It's the single most important part of the test because it informs the entire rest of the test. Reporting is almost as important as scoping, but I say it's a little bit behind because if you have a bad scope, you have not a good direction, you may not be testing everything you should, and therefore your report won't contain the things it should. So it's the most important step. And when we're in scoping, it's not just this is your URL, these are your creds, this is the time you have. You need to talk to the client, you need to find out what's important to them. Why is this app important to them and why are they awesome? So why is this app important to them and why are they wanting this test and what are they worried about happening? And it might not be SQL injection, it might not be cross-site scripting, it might not be stealing you know, data out of the application. It might be that they are really worried about users being able to influence other users and doing lateral uh, privilege attacks. They may be worried about protecting admin accounts from user attacks. They may be worried about logic kinds of things, like the classic shopping cart vulnerability. You, add some, you go search for a product, you add the product to your cart, you go to checkout, you provide your payment details and your shipping details, and then you go to the verification page and it says, great, you have your stuff. But this vulnerability did exist in websites many times where you added something to your cart and you went to the verification page and the server said, well, if you're here, you should be here. Here's your stuff, and you never paid. So those logic kinds of vulnerabilities that no scanner is going to find, those are the kinds of things they may be worried about. So protecting sensitive resources and data, the back-end infrastructure, 
we have to find those things out from the client. And the unfortunate thing is sometimes they don't know. They have a regulatory requirement to do a test. They have a, uh, uh, someone said you have to have a test because a, you know their client said you need to have this thing tested. And that's all they know. So we might have to decide for them. And how do we do that? <clears throat> how do we do that on large apps, on really big apps, where in an ideal world, we would have all the time we needed to test the app thoroughly. It would be great. Money wasn't an issue. Time was an issue. We'd test everything. But that's not how the real world works. And the client may not have the budget for that. Either they don't have the budget of time. Oh, dang it. Is that it? Do you have a V8? Yeah, okay, I, don't, I don't drink. Oh, man. Oh, you know, this is my third DeerBecon talk. I've avoided this. <sighs> it's not bad, it's like soup. No, no, I did not say that at all. So uh, where was I? Oh yeah, client might not have the budget, either a budget from time or a budget from money. So we need to figure out how we can do an effective test within the budget of the client, what they can do. And so we start asking them, what is important? Where are the high impact functions in your application that if they were abused, have the highest impact? Whether that's financial risk, whether that's data being stolen, um, whether that's people being able to take over other people's accounts. We ask them, where are those important things in your application? Yeah, it's really not bad. It's a lot better than I thought. At least you're healthy. That's right. Vitamin C and all kinds of vegetables. So, uh, for example, at a previous job, we had this app that was not just an app. It was like six or seven apps in one. And after talking to this team, about their app, my team got together and said, how long do we think this is going to take? And we came up with four to six months for two people. So that's eight months to a year for one person to test one application to get through everything. I can tell you I don't want to spend that long looking at one app. The client doesn't want to wait that long because they need to get this app launched to support business needs. So what do we do? We sat down with them and we asked them where are the areas that if they were exploited would have the highest impact. And they didn't understand it at first, so we had to give them some scenarios, help them understand what happens. This app happens to uh, process over a trillion dollars of transactions every year. It does things like we get paid in rubles because we're a global company, but it's advantageous for us to take our money out in euros because we have analytics that tell us right now the exchange rate is favorable, let's do that. Or we just got paid. If we leave this money in the account one more day, we will make $50,000 in interest because of our analytics say that's the way interest rates are going. So if I, as, as a malicious user, because we're not thinking about external attackers for this particular application, it was really internal threat, and that's something you need to identify too. We determine what if there's a disgruntled employee that either wants to harm the application because they are harm the company because they didn't get a uh, promotion, or they want to move money to their own account because that's something that a user that got access to the wrong role could do. Once we explain those things, they, the light went on. They went, oh, okay. So now they put together a list of 15 things that are the highest risk to the application. And we, as a pen testing team, had thought about some of the areas that were needed to be focused on. And a lot of those things matched up based on what they told us. So you need to ask the client those kinds of questions and understand what's happening in the app. It's not just, what does your app do? What's the URL? All right, good. So other things that you need to focus on, now let's just keep this until it's done. Ooh, shake it before you drink it all. <laughs> So other things you might need to focus on. Let's say you've got a, you got a .NET app. .NET has some pretty good protections for cross-site scripting and injection flaws. It's got good session management libraries. It's got good cross-site request forgery protections. But if your client decides that they have written their own libraries for that, for whatever reason, that is something you need to identify and focus on in addition to whatever else is there because 
those custom libraries probably haven't been tested as much as Microsoft's have and are more likely to have issues. So ask that question. Along those lines of development, if this is a white box test in an ideal world, the client should be open to you and telling you things you need to know about the application to get the job done successfully. Ask if you can talk to the developers. Uh, lots of times we have disparaging remarks about developers and think that they don't know what they're doing and they don't care about writing secure code, and that's not true at all. Every developer I have talked to cares about the application, cares about the code they write, but aren't given the resources to do the job they need. So they do the best they can. And they want to know if their app is secure. I've had them tell that many times, like, I want to know if this thing that I wrote is secure. Ask them where the skeletons are. Ask them what keeps them up at night about their code. Make sure you focus on those areas. And if you have development skills, maybe see if you can pull in a code review. Take a look at the code. You can find vulnerabilities beforehand, and you can verify exploitability in the code base if you find a flaw. If you don't have the ability to do that or don't have the time, ask if the client has done some kind of code audit, you know, with some type of static analysis tool, went through the code, found issues. Ask them if they've done that. Ask them what's been remediated. Look at those areas that are remaining. Now, as much as I love scoping, we do need to talk about actual testing. Oh, it's horrible. So what I do is I've got kind of a pre-authentication workflow and a post-authentication workflow. And some of those things cross over. In pre-authentication workflow, we're doing enumeration about the application and about the server. If you have a PCI client, they're probably going to want to know about this, so I always run SSL scan. I want to do uh, uh, an analysis on TSL or TLS. And I might use SSL scan. There's uh, test SSL.sh, uh, TLS SSLED. Uh, there's a bunch of utilities out there, but you need to go out and do that kind of enumeration. And I use Nikto. It's been around a long time, and it still works. It tells me about default content I need to know about and report on tells me about common configuration issues I need to report on. It tells me about, uh, it tells me about common header misconfigurations that I'm going to need to report on where they're giving. You know, you see the Apache server with like t two lines of powered by included stuff, those kinds of things that we need to report on. I also use Nmap script scans sometimes. Those can be helpful. And then I'm going to do some kind of deer busting, which I'll talk more about in just a little bit. Look at the robots.txt file because the administrator has said, hey, search engine, this is important stuff that I don't want you to index, which tells me that's important stuff I definitely need to look at. Sitemap.xml will tell you things about the site. Google dorks, Google, get on your search engine if this is a public-facing application or if this is an existing code base uh, or some type of commercial off-the-shelf application. Go out and do some OSINT on your, on your app and find out if there are issues, especially if this is an existing application that's internet facing, it's been indexed before. Oftentimes, an upgrade has been, been performed. And so that they can back out, they don't remove all the old functionality. Now, if you navigated every link in the application, looked at all the source, you might not find links to these resources, but they've been indexed in a search engine. You can go out there and look for those links in the application. You might have an auth bypass, or at least you found something that they felt the need to take out of the application that may have issues with it. I, uh, along those lines, the Wayback Machine, oh, the Wayback Machine can be very good for you. Uh, we were just talking about this in, in a Slack the other day before I came here. Someone was testing this app, hadn't found much. They went to the Wayback Machine, archive.org, and they found a certain link in the application that they had not found through their enumeration, that link had vulnerabilities in it that were not in the entire rest of the application that were allowed them to you know, get the win, whatever that vulnerability was. But they found it from the Wayback Machine. So add that into your inventory and part of your enumeration that you're doing. <clears throat> Talk about dir busting a little bit. So I like to use GoBuster. Uh, it's what I've been using lately because of speed, and GoBuster is fast. It's really fast. You can queue up a lot of threads if your target will support it. You can get through big word lists pretty quickly. Downside is it is not recursive. So it doesn't have the ability 
to say I found a directory and then drop into that directory and perform the same search again like Derby or Durbuster will. So be aware of that, that you might need to have a process for identifying directories, dropping in, doing that again. I still like it because of speed. And I usually use the Durbuster directory list 2.3 medium or directory list lowercase 2.3, depending if the service case sensitive. It's a good starting point. It's a sizable list that has a lot of content in it that usually finds things with the trade-off of not being so long to run. There's also some things like the Robots Disallowed Project. I think the guy, Daniel Meisler, I think is his name, his last name. Uh, Daniel has this Robots Disallowed Project on GitHub where he went out and analyzed the Alexa top one million uh, websites, pulled their robots.txt files down, and did an analysis. What are the most common entries in robots.txt? And so you can pull down lists of the top 100 or the top 1,000, the top 10,000 or whatever, and use those as a point for enumerating information in the application. And if, if I haven't made it clear, there are things you will find doing this enumeration that you may not find if you submitted every form, clicked on every link, and looked at all the responses coming back from the server because they're just not linked within the application. But they're part of the application, maybe an admin console, whatever, that may have issues. So that's why we're trying to discover this content. Along the same lines, Daniel has a sec list project that has all kinds of word lists. And in his discovery web content list, he has technology specific lists. If you run across a Lotus Domino server, they do exist. Uh, you can find specific kinds of resources that are, that are specific to Lotus Domino that help you understand that target or Tomcat or WordPress or something else. Also, check for more than just directories, check for content. So use the dash X flag to specify your file extensions. And that might be, you know, on an AS, or .NET website, of course, ASPX or ASP or ASHX. But we're also looking for things that are left around from troubleshooting, .log, from upgrades, and installs, .sql, .text, .back. Those can be gold mines of information that might not be protected by any kinds of authentication. And if you can enumerate them, you can download them and get that information. So use dash x to enumerate files. It's useful to get a picture of the website from different perspectives. So what does it look like on an iOS device versus Safari on Mac to IE on Windows? You can change your user agent string with dash A. And you should also do that using your other testing in Burp. You can programmatically change that and get different views. That's one thing you can do. And pay attention to status codes that you're getting back. Uh, I missed the first bullet, so I'll talk about that as well. Status codes you can tune with dash S. So that means what status codes represent a positive hit, something that actually exists on the web server. On lots of kind of content management systems, they will wildcard any result for something not found with a 301 or a 302 to some common page. As a result, your dir busting will think that every single thing it asked for exists on the server. So use dash S to specify what status codes specify a positive hit. And so you'll take 301 or 302 out of the list. And now it can bypass that, get you some more effective enumeration. As well as status codes, like your error codes, like 401, 403, 500. 401, 403, it probably exists. It exists, but you can't have it, or at least not in this user context. 500, it exists. Something went wrong. Either the server screwed up or you didn't give the right information. Perhaps it's a request that can only be postable and you try to get request, or it's a request that doesn't have the right parameters. And so you need to do your discovery and collect parameter names and see if you can use those. You can also fuzz for parameter names and values using wfuzz, but that's an exercise I'll leave to you. It's outside the scope of this. Now, effective enumeration, things that I do to make sure I have enumerated everything in the target. I don't run a crawler, any kind of automated scanner, anything like that until I make sure I've manually enumerated everything in the application. That means from unauthenticated, I click on every link I can. I find every link, every form I can submit. Then I log in as every user that I'm going to use in this test, and I click on every link, and I submit every form and make sure that I've enumerated everything 
and I make note of the important sensitive things. So logout functions. It's definitely something we're going to want to exclude during our automated testing because we don't want our scanner hitting the logout function and losing session stakes. The rest of the results are invalid. So we find that. And it might not be called logout. It might be called exit. It might be who knows. Also things that modify and delete data. If you have a crawler that's going through and there are a bunch of pages that have this, you can delete this object. You do not want your crawler just arbitrarily deleting everything it can because you don't know what impact that's going to have on your testing later down the road. So look for those functions, write them down, make sure that you have note of them and exclude them from your, add them to your excluded scope and burp or go specifically into like the scanner or the crawler tool, burp spider, and remove those, add those items to the list that says we're not going to scan this. And you need to work with the client to get good data. So this is part of your scoping again. This is a good data dictionary. And what I mean by that is, I said I need to submit every form. Well, if I have a five stage process where I have to look up something and hopefully it returns a result and then I interact with that result, I modify data about that thing that I submit it back to the server. If I don't have good information in the first phase, I'll never discover the thing, so I can't go and manipulate it, so there's these other stages that I never tested. So you need a good word list, and somewhere down the line, it may you're manipulating that object. If you don't know the right information to put in, you can't submit it for modification. That's what happened in that big app I was telling you about. Big financial app application. I'm not a financial guy. I don't know what these terms mean. I can't just like search for a widget, because that's not how this app works. So what we had the client do was put together a, a script, essentially go to this page, click on this box, put this value in this form, uncheck this radio button, click next, do these other things, click next, click next, until I had the full, full uh, scope of that transaction. I've ran it from end to end. I've fully enumerated that. And I want to do that for everything in the application. That way I've got a good understanding. I've got a complete understanding. And then and only then will I do my automated crawl. I like to use the burp spider, so I'll use the burp spider. But I'll only do that after I've removed everything from its scope that I think is dangerous. And I'll tell you why, based on experience. Uh, back before I started doing app pen testing, my coworker was doing app pen testing. And there was an app that we got asked to test in production because, of course, there was no test instance. So we tested this app. And this app was kind of a bookmarking app, if you will. The, the developers had it. And they could add a, add a resource for information about themselves. And they could add more and link them together. And one of the things they could do was delete something if it was no longer, um, if it was no longer applicable. Now, they knew that, you know, well, we don't want the security guys deleting our app because you would effectively delete the app if you followed all the delete links. So they said, we don't want them getting to that. So they edited the source code and commented it out. And unlike the rest of the internet where you should never read the comments section in web app pen testing, always read the comments section. Read the comments because there's gold in there. This was commented out. A spider like Burp Spider does not care if something's commented out. It sees it, says that's a link I need to, need to go and visit. I need to check that out, whether it's commented or not. So what happened when it visited that end delete equals true link? Deleted the resource. So within about two minutes of starting the test, now we did ask them, do you have a backup? They said yes. Then we asked them again, do you have a backup? Right before we started the test, they said yes. So we started the test. They knew we were starting the test. Within two minutes, someone's running down the hall screaming, stop, stop, just stop everything. And the crawler had deleted the entire application. We asked if they had a backup. They said yes. Narrator, they did not. <laughs> and and there was no there was virtually no application left. Now part of that's on the security team. That's part of that's on us because we didn't go out and look for that and remove that. That wasn't part of our process. But from that point on, that's been part of my process. Like what's going to happen? Because I don't want to I don't want to repeat that on a client's site and then find out they don't have a backup. V eight's kind of like soup. Only worse. 
<clears throat> so now methodology. I told you I would talk about the methodology that I use. Now, one of the things I got from Kevin Johnson, Secure Ideas, if you don't know who he is, Kevin Johnson, uh, was that you always have two windows open when you're testing. One is your browser window and one is your proxy. And I can tell you that when I'm testing, the browser exists only to drive traffic to the proxy. I don't care about what's in the browser for the most part, because anything that's there, I'm going to see in the proxy anyways. And then I see the things that are in comments. I see the things that are in JavaScript that aren't going to fire because we haven't met some condition, but I can see it there. So I always have two windows open, and I'm looking at every request, and I'm looking at every response coming from the application looking for the comments, looking at the code, trying to understand what's happening. I'm making note of anything significant because at this point, I'm still not doing testing. I'm not doing you know, cross-site scripting or SQL injection testing. That's a lie. I might do that. But trying to avoid the ooh shiny rabbit hole, I want to make sure that I know what I think is most important about this application, what is most sensitive, what is the most likely thing to work for me. So. I'm doing the enumeration. Now, during this, always be enumerating, because our Durbuster is only going to go so far. Eventually, there are going to be directory directories that it's not going to have in the word list. So once you find those directories, spin up another instance of your Durbuster, whatever you're using, in the background against that particular set of directories. Take a look at that. Are there any more results that you need to go review? Make sure your scope and burp is correct. Uh, make sure you're not scanning outside of your scope, especially if you have a narrow scoped application. Like here is the site, but we're only testing this piece. You can map out the other pieces and put them in your exclusion list. You won't hit those. OK. Crawling considerations. Did you exclude sensitive content? I'll repeat this a bunch of times because it's important. Burp Spider can be very useful. And I find it to be very effective. There are things it does not find. I have heard reports that in version 2, there are things that the spider won't find. And because of the way it's working, it's never going to find because they've chosen to do that track. So make sure you are looking in the responses because you will find things in the responses that the spider is not going to find. Don't be Peter Wintering your client. How many have been using Burp a long time? How many of you have ever submitted some kind of application to your client as Peter Wiener? So for those of you that don't know, uh, the spider can automatically, automatically submit forms for you. And it will now submit your Peter Winter from Winterville, Wisconsin with Winter Consulting as your name. It used to do Peter Wiener. And you know whatever you're submitting it should be unless you're trying to be stealthy should be tied back to you so there's no question from the client was this you like what happened here i don't i don't know if you're subcontracting make sure that your name or your company's name is not in there make sure your your the people you're subcontracting for is in there another pro tip <clears throat> the burp discover content tool how many have tried to use that a couple of us eh, tim Thank you. Uh, the, the burp discover content tool can be useful, but it's like if a spider and derbuster took a lot of steroids and had babies um, with some huge word lists because it, it has this enormous amount of discovery it does, which can be good. It can find all kinds of things, and it has found things for me that I didn't know were there. The problem is because of how much it tests for, on a site of any size, if you don't tune it properly, it will take forever. And I've never successfully tuned it properly to not have it take forever. So it's there, and you should know about it. But it may not be, it may not be for you. It may not be the best tool. What is going on over there now? Is that static? Yeah. All right. You know, where are we? I'm going to go back up. I'm going to back up to this methodology because I forgot to tell you a story. So in this methodology, I am always looking at the contents and looking at the resources that are coming back from the server. 
I'm testing an application. In this application, I'm looking on the page. Everything looks fine from a user perspective. And there are user accounts and there are admin accounts in this application. And admins can add and delete new pro products, modify. They can add new product categories. They can delete whole product lines. And they can add users to the application or make a user an admin. I'm browsing as a user. In the browser, I see nothing except the few things that I can do as a user in the application. I'm looking at the response in burp, and I'm seeing this JavaScript, and like there's links to admin functionality. So here's this admin add user, admin modify user, admin delete user. This is not showing up anywhere in the browser, so I visit those links. I am an admin. That was the only protection was there was a piece of JavaScript that looked at a cookie that was set when you logged into the application. It wasn't admin equals true, but it might as well have been. So the cookie set up the user as an admin or a regular user, and then the JavaScript said, oh, you're an admin. Here are your links. And I could directly bypass that, and I would not have found that because the crawler didn't find it, and I wouldn't have seen it in the browser. But I looked at the source code coming back in the response, and now, boom, I was an admin of the application. That happens. That is a real-world scenario. I have ran into that more than one time. So that's why I'm always looking at those responses. I can't stress how important that is. Like the browser, it's great. It gets you to where you need to go, and that's all, all you need to use it for in a test. Um, you can change the user agent string without even changing the browser, although sometimes you, know, you need to use IE on Windows because Firefox on Kali or Firefox on Linux doesn't cut it for that particular app. But for the most part, the browser isn't the important thing for me. Forced browsing. <clears throat> so forced browsing is if I can request a resource directly without providing any authentication and the server gives me that resource, I have bypassed authentication. I have forced browsed. I discovered that thing. So how I test for that is twofold. One, if I'm sitting in burp in the repeater tab, I'm going to strip out the cookies. I'm going to send the response or send the request. Then look at the response. Did I get requested to auth? Did I get a deny? What happened? But I will also do a programmatic approach. So I'll go into, in Burp, in the target tab, I will look at my target, right click on the target, and select copy all links. And that'll copy every full link in the application. I'll paste that to a text file. And then I'll use some little script to feed that using curl and the dash x flag, curl dash sk dash x, and feed it into Burp. And now I can do a run, and I can look in Burp, and I can see every response and whether or not I got requested or redirected to authentication or denied. And if one of those things doesn't get denied, that might be forced browsing. It might just be a script that they give to anyone. But I use that to identify if there's any way of bypassing authentication in the application, and it happens very quickly. I don't have to manually test everything every time. <clears throat> Review the results in the proxy. On you go. So I have some tips and tricks, and I'm way ahead of time, so apparently I've been talking really fast. Um, this tip is not from me. It is from Tim Tomes, Landmaster 53. He gave this talk last year. He gave a talk where he talked about these tips and tricks for making burp more useful and, and getting more out of using burp and pen testing in general go check out his talk, because there is gold in there. There are some things he talked about that I've been testing a long time that I had no idea. Like this one. Using the intruder to target specific parameters during testing. So normally, if you just right-click and send something to the scanner from the proxy or the repeater tab, it'll scan every parameter, and it will scan all the headers as well, or a bunch of the headers. It's going to try manipulating cookies and the host header and other headers that are there. But sometimes that's not what you want to do. So you can do this. This is the intruder tab here. Wow, you can't see the laser pointer at all. But So we have the intruder tab. And I've got some parameters. And I only want to test admin and passwords. So I could use intruder to do a brute force against authentication. But in this case, I just want to test these two parameters. Right click, actively scan defined insertion points. That'll send that request to the scanner, and it will only test 
the username and the password parameter that I've highlighted there. So that was a game changer. It's like, now I can do much more effective testing. Lots of times when you're manipulating cookies, you get logged out of the application. You don't want that. Sometimes you've already done that kind of stuff. You just want real targeted testing. The intruder can be used for that. Another tip, you can rename tabs in, in Burp, or in, in Repeater and in other Burp applications. How many knew that? How many knew that before Tim gave that talk last year? All right, one person. All right, so not many people know that. It is magical. Because now, at the end of a test, I have hundreds of tabs sometimes of all the different things I've done. And I've got a notebook or a OneNote that says, like, SQL injection in 27, 55, 93. Cross-site scripting in 17, 26, whatever. And I've got this list, and I have to find that list because those are the things that are important I want to know about. Now, you just double click right there where the numbers should be. Tim found this by happy accident. He was trying to click the X he missed and he's like, wait, there's a cursor there. And he realized he could type it in. When I found that out, I'm telling you, it was magical. I was, my mind was blown because I had wanted that functionality for so long and it was there. So there's some magic in there. I, d I don't know what else is there. This, double click on the tab and you can rename it. Tremendously useful for organization. In the intruder, or in Burp, in the proxy tab, you can use color coding to keep track of things. So whatever you choose to use it for, I don't use this a whole lot other than to maybe mark where login and logout requests are. Um, I will use it to mark where uh, certain significant events happen, and then I'll record that elsewhere as well. But you can just right-click, or not right-click, just single-click in the number column here. Single click here, and you'll get this drop down where you can add a color and use that for however you f see fit. It's very useful for organization, and I don't do it enough, but I wish, you know, I did at some times, and I wish I knew about it long before I did. <clears throat> Nested parameters. Um, this is something that threw me off when I first encountered this. I hadn't encountered this until. PeopleSoft applications, and now I realize that I've seen it a few times, and I probably didn't pay attention close enough. So this is standard intruder. We've got this request, and intruder has automatically highlighted the things it thinks are important that it needs to test. So these two cookie values and these two parameters, it highlighted those automatically. Now we have one parameter here, it's a regular parameter, true. We have this other parameter, it's highlighted everything and it thinks that entire blob is one parameter. Except that's not one parameter, that's nine parameters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, separated by URL encoded pipe characters. And manipulating any one of those has an impact on this application that I was testing. So now, because I know that I can use the intruder to do targeted testing of those parameters, I can clear the values and I can say, I just want to test those three parts of this entire parameter. Burp otherwise has no way of knowing that that is a parameter. Uh, if you've ever tested JSON requests, so you see JSON, you've got just these gigantic blurb of things together, and sometimes Burp doesn't really know. Most time it knows, but sometimes it doesn't know what the parameters are. Or, again, targeted testing, you want to test just one particular thing. The intruder, target testing, nested parameters like this will give you that ability to test those specific things. Keeping state with macros. How many have ever written a macro to log in or grab CSERF tokens? How many have tried to do it and did it unsuccessfully? Okay, so how many of you really would like to know about it, but you look at that interface and be like, I'm out. This is too much. Let's be honest. I, I have done that. Okay, thank you. It is complex. It is sometimes difficult to understand and a little bit intimidating. You're like, what does this mean? Uh, I wrote a blog article about this, and uh, you can find it on the Red Siege blog, blog.redsiege.com. Uh, Robin Wood, Digi Ninja, wrote a blog about this. He's also written an application that you can actually download and test against for using macros. So mine talks more about like logging into an application. Robin's was about CSERF tokens, but the process is very similar. And you write a macro that 
determines the state of a page. So are you logged in or are you logged out? And now the tools that you apply that macro to, like say the scanner, every request the scanner sends, it'll check to see, am I logged in? And if it's logged out, you can have a macro that logs you back in so that your scan request is authenticated, which is what you want, because sending that request to the unauthenticated person of the website probably doesn't help. Same thing with CSERF tokens. If you have something that's protected by CSERF that you, CSERF tokens that you can't otherwise bypass, you can tell the scanner or whatever tool you're working with, load the page, grab the macro, and you, you can define exactly where that, uh, or grab the CSERF token, exactly where that is on the page is, you can define in multiple ways. And then use that, that CSERF token as the input for the next request when it's doing its actual scan test. So Robin's got a really good blog about doing that. Uh, DigiNinja, is that right? Is that right? DigiNinja on, uh, on the Twitters. Check out Robin's uh, uh, blog site because he's got content on that that's very helpful. I, I was helpful to me in understanding how this works. And getting comfortable with macros is kind of a level up in using Burp. It's like that next step that makes things much more effective for you. I also use this to stay logged in when I was testing an app with SQL Map. See, uh, the app got angry with some of the things I was doing with SQL Map and it would be like, you've had enough, you logged out. So I just proxied everything through Burp and then I had a login macro that said, am I logged in? Nope, you just got logged out. Logs me back in, sends the, the Burp request or the SQL Map request through so I never got logged out. That worked. Final tip that I can give you, and uh, I'm a little ahead of time, uh, is read the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. Uh, I don't know how recently it's been updated. Mine is like the second edition. I pulled it out before this talk, and some of the content is dated, but it is absolutely still relevant. Um, the process of testing, the understanding how things are working, enumerating applications, it is still a very valuable resource. and. If you can't pay the amount of money it takes to go to 542 at Sands, read that book because that's the, that's what I did before I went to Sands and that's when I realized I needed to go and I had a, was fortunate to have an employer send me. So that's kind of the scoping and the methodology and the tips and tricks that I have used that have made me much more effective. And today I don't get ooh shinied down the rabbit hole that often. It does still happen. Uh, I've also become more aware of how much time it is, so I say, I'm going to work on this for a half hour, and if I don't get anywhere, i got to go. But it does happen, and you can prevent that by applying some discipline up front, knowing where you need to go with your scope, having a methodology, and effective enumeration processes that get you all that through the, through the entire process. Uh, as I said, Mike at RedSiege.com, Hardwater Hacker on Twitter. Check out Red Siege InfoSec uh, for our Twitter account and some of the blogs that come out of there. Um, Red Siege has stickers. We are offensive. Uh, and this awesome, sometimes it's a helmet, sometimes it's a castle. I didn't even realize it was a castle until Tim pointed it out yesterday. I've had this sticker for I don't know how long. I was like, what? <laughs> we have stickers. Tim is back there, he has stickers. I believe he has some shirts. We have some I Am Offensive shirts and Make Their Hacky Hack Hack, possibly. I don't know, that's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, these slides, if you were taking pictures and you wanted to get a better copy of them, redsiege.com slash WA101, you'll be able to download the PDF. With that, um, that's what I have. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, so the question was, what happened for the company that, yeah, we have a backup, yeah, we have a backup? They didn't have an app after that because the app had deleted itself or our scanner had deleted the app. Thank you. Thank you. No?